We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. And today we're very lucky and honored to have with us Erica Schwartz, the executive director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Do I got that right? Yes. So Erica, welcome. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where you're from and how your values came about to be doing this important work. Thanks. Well, I actually grew up in Maryland and over the course of my life, <laughs> I kept getting further and further away from my parents. My mother was to my mother's dismay. Um, <laughs> And um, I, I'd say, and I, and I came up to New England, as so many people do, for graduate school at Tufts Urban and Environmental mm -hmm. Policy Program, and I stayed in the area, obviously, after doing that. But, um, you know, I thought a lot about where my values came from, mm -hmm. and I, I think one of the biggest places was actually a summer camp I went to growing up, which was, likes to say that it's part of actually a movement, mm -hmm. not just a summer camp. Uh, my parents thought they were just sending me to a good Jewish summer camp, as so many young Jews do in the summer. Um, but this was really a summer camp that had uh, socialist values underpinning mm. it all. And uh, the summer camp itself was sort of modeled after kibbutz lifestyle, the communal mm. settlements in Israel. Um, and so we would have camp activities included discussions of sexism and equality issues like that those were the fun things we did at camp and <laughs> we would all we'd have work groups before breakfast you might build a bench for the camp or um, clean mm. the bathroom so there was this very sense of we're, we're all here taking care of each other and taking mm. care of this community together mm. um, and that instilled in me a real sense of I think communal responsibility that we all mm. really have an obligation to the whole and it, mm. it instilled in me, I think, a sense of personal responsibility that I have an obligation. Mm. And the one other thing it did was, because I was a pretty shy kid and a little insecure, it told me the, the, that camp really instilled in the message in me that you, ha you should have an opinion mm. and you should hear what other people's opinions are, but you shouldn't just sit there and not have an opinion. That you, have an, you should have an opinion and your opinion matters and you should say what it is, mm. um, which was took me a long time to really embody in my life, but mm. um, those were deep foundational messages that I got as a kid. That's great. And what's the camp called? It's called Camp Moshava. There oh. are, it's a, it's a camp that's part of the Habonim Dror oh, movement. Yeah. So oh. there's several across North America, if anyone wants to send their kids. It's a, a very inclusive, in the deepest sense, kind of place. Uh -huh. Were there other uh, things, uh, your parents or other places where your values came from? Yeah, and I, they certainly must have come from my parents also. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of what informs me, and I think about this a lot today, is that being Jewish, I am the descendant of people who either survived Nazi Germany or on the other side mm -hmm. of my family, pogroms of Eastern Europe and just discrimination mm -hmm. against Jews of Eastern Europe from the eight, in the 1800s. My mother's side of the family came to this country in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the other side during World War II. 
And so I think, I, I would like to think that you don't have to have experienced that kind of trauma in your family to have mm. empathy for other people going through something similar. But I know for me, I feel like I have a deep sense and I can, I, I can see similarities between my family and other populations who are going through mm. terrible, terrible things because from, from the youngest age, I don't even have memories of not knowing that my family had escaped Nazi Germany and, and, mm. and narrowly, and, and that many of my families died in Germany, mm -hmm. family members. So um, I think that gives me a sense of understanding of how, mm. how cruel the world can be, but also how difficult it can be, what people's, I can imagine other people's experiences, or I, or I try to the best I can. Mm -hmm. And how did um, your family get out of Germany? Um, so my grand, my father's parents met in New York City, so they left separately. So um, my grandfather, his father, really saw the writing on the wall and mm. started trying to tell their extended family, like, <clears throat> we've got to get out of here. And no one in the extended family agreed with him. But in 1936, when you could still take out your money, your some belongings, he had a business that he wasn't able to operate anymore. It was like a scrap metal junk business. But he took his immediate family, so um, my, my grandfather and um, mm. his sister and his wife, you know, that was my great-grandfather, and they actually, they had to escape their town, they escaped to another town, but in 1936, they came to New York. I still have their mm. dining room table. They were able to wow. bring out a lot of things. Mm. My grandmother, um, on a whim, when she was, she was like a dreamer, and when she was around 10 years old, she told a family friend that she always wanted to go to America, and as a, as, a, as a fun little gift, that family friend helped her fill out a visa application, just like a fun little gift. And this was in 19, this would have been around 1929. Mm. So before they really knew, or I don't know, maybe the writing was a little on the wall, but, um, and then when things got really bad, she had this visa application that no one else in her immediate family had, which she was able to use to come to America by, when she, you know, by herself at the age of, it was 1939, before her birthday, at the age of, like, 19. Um, and the rest of her family had to scramble and manage to go to England. So um, they had a much more harrowing situation. She lived through Kristallnacht, um, when government and individuals alike just assaulted people's people and their homes and their business and property. And um, lots of stories from that side of the family, mm -hmm. scary, scary stories. Yeah. So uh, fast forward to uh, coming to Massachusetts. How did you end up uh, not only where you are, but getting into the work of affordable housing? And yeah, when I was in graduate from? school, I wasn't really sure what specific focus I wanted to have. Um, and I didn't concentrate on housing issues. Mm. But I, it was the first time I really learned what community organizing was. As a kid, I thought, wow, I wanted to be an activist when I grew up, but I didn't know what that job was or like what, uh -huh. what did you do if you wanted to change things. Mm. And it wasn't until I was in graduate school that I really understood what community organizing was. And I was really? very interested in that. Mm. Applied for a job. I got my first job at the Watch CDC in oh, Waltham yeah. mm -hmm. as an organizer. So I was a brand new organizer organizing around housing and tenant issues. Mm. And I quickly realized that housing is just one of the, the most foundational and important issues and that mm -hmm. there's this incredible crisis. And this was in 2001. It was like, oh my gosh, this is such a terrible, terrible crisis. And <clears throat> the crisis then seems so tame to what we have now. It's hard to believe if you had told people then what the situation we're in now, it just would have been unfathomable. And yet here we are. Um, but so I sort of fell into the housing issue, but quickly <clears throat> came to feel that this was just core and and mm -hmm. have really for the most part in my career been working in some way on housing ever since and how did you get introduced at tufts to community organizing i guess i must have been drawn to it because i did have this feeling of wanting to make change and there were mm. a few courses that um touched on that and i pursued them and mm. which courses were, was that do you oh recall gosh, i don't remember that's okay uh, i do remember one of my professors was melvin cologne who i think oh, now yeah. lives in Connecticut, connecticut but yeah. he was very active in some early organizing in dorchester right. um know. several decades yeah. ago so um he was oh, definitely great. one person teaching there who who would come from sort of an activist background and right. was passing that on right so and what led you to uh, arlington now you're uh, in here in arlington which 
as far as I can tell, I've been here 25 years, it's uh, affordable housing in Arlington seemed like an oxymoron. Tell me, uh, what's going on from your point of view? Yeah, and so I've been in Arlington less than two years, and so mm. I have a lot to learn. I, I mm. love getting more steeped and really knowing a community, and I'm mm. still on that process. Mm -hmm. um, and I was really excited to take this job because there is this organization, Housing Corporation of Arlington, that actually got started in 1986. And at that time, it, we, we weren't developing housing. We were doing first-time homebuyer courses. And, you know, any organization has to start small and then grow. But I think as the whole region has just become outrageously, like, horrifically more and more expensive. It's just exponentially getting more and more expensive. At the same time, there was this organization that in Arlington, at least, I think was creating bit by bit in the early years, actual affordable housing by buying up two families and converting them, but also changing the conversation and educating people about why this is so important and why we don't want to have a community mm -hmm. where you're barred from living there just because you don't earn a certain amount of money. Um, and that, I think, makes Arlington really special. There's not, you know, not every community that has this much wealth also has this much affordable housing or a population that understands how important affordable housing is. Mm -hmm. I think that's unique in Arlington. Not that, you know, not that everyone agrees on every issue, but um, there's, I feel like there's a general sense here that this is something that's important. But we're, you know, we're, we're hugely away from being able to meet the needs of our current residents, even people today, there's so many people that are paying just a completely unsustainable percentage of their income towards housing, or they're just living in really poor conditions, despite the fact that I think Arlington does a decent job of trying to go after building owners that not, aren't maintaining their mm -hmm. buildings, but it, it can be hard to do. It can be a little bit of a cat and mouse game. So the, the buildings with the problems that are just <coughs> dangerous and disgusting and that none of us would want to live in, those are the places that are cheaper. Um, and so people who don't have restricted, protected, affordable housing end up there. So um, we definitely have a long way to go. And the worse the, the crisis has gotten, the, the more people it affects. So it's like the crisis is creeping up the income scale that, you know, you could have a job that even just 10 years ago would have been great, get you a solid apartment. And today that same salary just you know, that position you're making maybe earns the same as it did 10 years ago, but that salary is not getting you a decent apartment. Right. And so we have people making very little money, you know, working full time at Dunkin' Donuts or something, super, super struggling. I mean, just impossible. But then all the way up to someone who might have even a master's degree <coughs> um, with some, some kind of professional skill. The person at Dunkin' Donuts might have a professional skill too, just isn't able to get a, a better job. But mm -hmm. so we just have this, it's like this growing number of households and growing, you know, categories of income of people that just can't afford this most basic thing that we all need. And, and when you talked about the housing that is not great and there's this cat and mouse game, what do you, could you describe what you mean? In yeah, and I've, I've only heard terms? of a few buildings in Arlington that, that are like this. I don't know the full story, mm -hmm. but, but I definitely know of, of one or two. Um, but I've seen it so much in my history just working in this field um, that you have a landlord who's not maintaining the building and they're trying to charge as high rents as they can while still investing as little money as they can. And a tenant will complain to the landlord. They don't get anywhere. So they make a more formal complaint to the town or the city who's then going to come out and inspect it. And they find all sorts of problems and they send the landlord the notice saying you have to fix these things by this amount, by this date. And the landlord will patch it up just enough just to get that notice off their mm -hmm. back. And so things might be fine for a few months till the next thing that the landlord should have been taking care of breaks or that same thing breaks again because they really didn't invest the funds to do it right or to fix it sustainably. Right. And so, so it's yeah. the, the, the building <clears throat> is just constantly in a state of, you know, often I would see, you know, insect infestations or rodents or constant plumbing issues that would cause mold issues, just, you know, some kind of electrical thing that wasn't right. Just the heating system would just get patched. It was just constant things breaking that are really important, like your plumbing and your heating and not wanting to live with rodents. And, um, and there just, there wasn't sort of a, the cities and towns didn't seem to have to have the right to sort of 
I have heard <coughs> ideas, and, and I, I, I think there might be some place maybe in like Northern Virginia that does this, I forget now, but years ago I worked with a wonderful woman, and her passion that she would have loved to have seen happen is you know, a landlord licensing program that, you know, you have so many chances and if you keep violating safety code, then maybe you get the license to be a landlord taken away mm. and then you're not allowed to be a landlord. And if you keep doing mm. that, it's a criminal offense or it's some kind of more serious violation. Mm. But cities and towns don't have that. They don't have that authority. They just have the authority to, to say, you violated this code. You need to fix it by this date. Okay, you fixed it. And it's, it's not for some, some owners who aren't responsible it is, it's just constant hardship right. on tenants. So what are you trying to do at the Housing Corporation of Arlington to deal with some of these things given the limits obviously you have and you know, yeah. it's a small organization. Tell us what's working, what's not working, what might help perhaps? Um, <laughs> right now we are a small organization and we don't organize tenants. Maybe that's something we'll do in the future. We, we, we help support our own tenants in organizing um, so that they can tell us what we need to do better as managers because we're not perfect either. It's, it is hard to own property. It's hard to be a landlord and probably nobody ever does it perfectly. Um, so we've started to organize our own tenants so they can be um, our partners really in telling us what's wrong but also thinking through tough challenges. It takes mm -hmm. a lot of money to, to maintain old properties. Many of our, pro we, have, we have a lot of, our properties were built between 1826 and 2002. When you we, talk about our properties, give us just the basics. I haven't even started there. So give Housing Corporation of Arlington yeah, owns 150 apartments wow. throughout <laughs> Arlington. And these in, are all rentals. They're all rental apartments. And those are in buildings that have anywhere from two units, just a two family, to, well, a development. It's a couple different buildings, but like one <clears> development <throat> that's sort of developed at the same time of 48 units. So it's, you know, we have buildings that have five units, nine units, lots of range. And some of our buildings are, are really old. I said, as I said, we have one building that was built in 1826, very cool historic building, the Kimball Farmer House. Um, and, and every decade since, pretty much. Um, so it, we are always looking for funds to, to maintain them. And right now, we're, we're in a process to do a capital needs assessment because we do have buildings that could use a, a big infusion of capital to bring them up to a better standard so that we can maintain mm -hmm. them better, they're more comfortable for our, our tenants, they're more energy efficient. Um, so we have a lot of work we're looking to do. So money is always helpful. So, so where does your money come from or where do you think it could, and where do you think yeah. it could come from or should come from? When we develop our housing, <clears throat> you know, we get a lot of <clears throat> subsidies at that moment that help take down our costs of acquisition or rehab or construction <clears throat> so that then we can charge lower rents. Um, and so if the buildings stayed just as they were in that perfect condition, we'd be fine. The rents should cover all the expenses. But over time, we do need more money. So um, we're going to be looking for to multiple sources. Um, in some cases for our properties, we'll, we have loans that are coming due and we'll be refinancing them. So we'll be able to refinance, hoping interest rates come down later this year, we'll be able to refinance into new loans and possibly sort of take some money out so we can do some repairs. Um, it is difficult, just the way the, the, the world of financing, it's difficult to find money to do capital repairs unless you have a major, major sort of capital project to do. And in that case, we would go to the state. Um, the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, directly through its own state funds or by administering federal funds, has <clears throat> the biggest amount of subsidies. So when we're doing a new development, that's the majority of our subsidies comes, comes from the state, either through, through their own programs or these federal programs. And when you say it comes from the state, I've heard like that doesn't just show up. I mean, what's the, tell us a little bit about what it's really like to get the subsidy from the, the state. Sure, so we have a very <laughs> exciting project right now that I, it's not included in our 150 units that we already own. We're developing a new um, site at 10 Sunnyside Ave, 43 affordable apartments. It's going to be beautiful with a community room, um, sort of a, a green space. And we actually just had to submit what's called a one-stop application. So we, we already had to borrow money to acquire <coughs> the site. And in that loan that let us buy the site, we also borrowed a little extra money to, so we could pay our architect and our zoning attorney and, and all these, and a consultant that, that helps me really bring technical expertise and crunch the numbers, all that money we have to spend even before we apply to the state for money um, because we have to 
have plans and know what we're doing and have our zoning in place. So we've done all that. And then we had to put together a really immense application to the state for many, many millions of dollars. And we're requesting funds from the federal low income housing tax credit program, which is a program that funds the majority of affordable housing in the country. It's a huge program. And also from a bunch of other little programs that the state just runs specifically to target different kinds of housing. Um, and so that is a huge application. It's a one stop that they call it because you apply for all these things at once. And that's like the moment. So it's we'll, very complicated. It's very complicated. We have to get our architect and our property manager and our general contractor all to fill out different forms. And I have to fill out forms and we have to give historical data and parse out your budget in different ways. It's right. very complex. It's very complex. So what would you, with all your experience now, recommend? You know, I mean, 150, and if you get this, that's maybe not even 200 units in Arlington where there are thousands. What do you think? Do you have some sense of what would really work? I mean, right now, I just, I could tell you and everyone who probably lives in town could tell us, I've been here about 25 years and the town's moved from having a place where working class people can live to one where they just can't afford it. Yeah. Um, do you have some sense of what might actually really work to change things uh, and get out of this crisis that we're in where uh, people that haven't bought 30 or 25, 30, 40 years ago can't afford to live here. Yeah, and it's, you know, like anything, it isn't just one thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to tick through the multiple things yeah. I think that are really important. One thing is some legislation at the state house right now, and anyone who, watching mm -hmm. who wants to contact their state reps, or, uh, right, state rep or senator, um, is called the Tenant Opportunity to Purchase Act, TOPA. Um, mm -hmm. This was something that w passed through the legislature a few years ago, and it was vetoed by Governor Baker. Really unfortunate that he did that. But this would give, you know, one, one strategy overall, you know, we can build, but we're not going to build our way out of it, as people say. The other is acquisition. We have tons of buildings already here that we could capture and preserve and make them affordable in perpetuity. And TOPA is one tool for doing that. So the tenant opportunity to purchase basically would require um, a... A, an apartment building owner who wants to sell their building, and this excludes smaller buildings, um, but larger mm -hmm. apartment buildings, it requires them to give the tenants or the tenants designee, like a nonprofit or a housing authority or their local government, the opportunity to match a third party offer. So that owner still gets a fair market price on their building, um, and they were going to sell it anyway. It's not forcing anyone to sell. And then the tenants or their designee get to capture it as affordable. It's a hugely important opportunity to get this passed now. Um, but in general, just being able to acquire, having more, and it, so much of it comes down to money. If we had funds to be mm -hmm. able to acquire buildings, probably at market rates, you know, we've, we've let, as collectively, the society has let this system get so insane that somebody who bought their property for a ridiculous amount of money five years ago I mean, it's, it's not a reasonable situation to expect them to now sell it you know, for less than the market says it's worth. Mm -hmm. So in reality, we do need money to, to be able to, to buy up existing buildings. I think that's one strategy. And TOPA would be one way that a building mm -hmm. that's being sold anyway will, will end up to be, being affordable. Um, this is allowing the tenants who live there to buy it or through that's right. the, Arlington, uh, the Housing Corporation of Arlington or some other nonprofit. Right. So and someone's not making a profit off their rents. Or housing, right, and you know. it would be preserved as affordable. This a similar law has been working in Washington D.C. for many decades, and mm -hmm. has generated so many affordable units that happen so much quicker than when you have to build something from new, mm -hmm. from scratch. So, um, another strategy. This is something that's being thought of in Arlington, but um, was implemented already in Cambridge. Is an affordable housing overlay. So you, know, you can build stuff, but then zoning is the other thing that can be very restrictive in a lot of communities in Massachusetts. And an affordable housing overlay would create areas in the town where if you were building overwhelmingly affordable, ha affordable units, mm -hmm. not some minimal amount, but the entire 100 percent or some, you know, 80 percent of units being affordable, that you'd be able to build it by right in, in you know, mm -hmm. under certain conditions. And this talk about affordable housing, sometimes what does that really mean in terms of real numbers? This is 2024. Either we're talking about a rental or buying a house. What is 
this meaning affordable. What, well, and what unfortunately, do you call affordable? affordable really doesn't mean affordable anymore, dep depending on who you're talking to. So the, the, I'm talking to you. Okay. Well, <laughs> and, and, and the, the programs that we have to, oh, I just touched my microphone, the programs that we have to work within, I struggle with because they're not really reaching the populations that we were thinking about when this organization. Well, t talk really to us started. numbers. What are we so, talking about? Um, a two bedroom apartment might be $2,000 a month under these subsidy programs. That, that subsidize us to create affordable housing. $2,000 a month. And that is the, the target if you don't earn more than 60% of the area median income. Which is what? Oh boy, <clears throat> I'm not recalling that number off the top of my head. Okay. We'd have to do the math backwards. Um, and it, it, it's different for different households. But if, a two bedroom apartment. But a two bedroom apartment, let's say for a household of three, that would be $2,000, it could be $2,000 a month under these subsidy programs. It could be less, we could set it at less. But and the that's way, before you're paying heat and electricity? That's right. Wow. So you're probably spending another at least a couple hundred dollars on top of that. You could every be. Every month. Right. So years ago, and, and that's because we have these, these <clears> numbers <throat> set annually by HUD that look at a, a region. And the region that we're in is a very wealthy region. So as the region's mm -hmm. incomes go up, as more people are working in Kendall Square and having you know, biotech and tech jobs, they're, they're part of this, this region, their incomes gets factored mm -hmm. into a whole, and then 60% is calculated out of that to determine what's, what, that's mm -hmm. gonna be the cutoff for affordable housing, or, or in some cases, 80%. Right. And so that number has been ticking up, but the incomes of people who are really struggling, their incomes haven't been going up as much as, right. uh, as other people in the region who are impacting that, that number. So, so, yeah. so if, if you have, we don't have a lot of time left, I know, but if there was a message you wanted to give to people here in Arlington or people throughout the region in Boston and, and New England, what would you tell them about, uh, especially about housing and what yeah. might be possible to do? What would you like people to do or what do you think is... I think there's a few things. I think people, whenever they're I think they should make a point to find out who their state rep and state senator is. You can Google, you know, who, who's my elected officials in Massachusetts, and it's very easy to find. Mm -hmm. And communicate with them sometimes that you're really worried about affordable housing. You're really worried that you or, or people you interact with every, mm -hmm. every day in your community cannot afford to stay, or they're struggling, and it's, it's just hurting everyone. And, you know, maybe there's a particular bill you want to advocate for, but even just that message mm -hmm. that we need to figure out this problem. I do think one message is also that current affordable housing, the, the structures and the financials that an organization like mine has to work within, it's not getting deep enough that we need more resources or programs that actually target families who are really at risk of being homeless. Mm -hmm. um, because even they often can't afford the affordable housing. The two thousand um, dollar plus a month sure. for a two bedroom. I hear and That's I hear not, people all yeah. the time saying, "I I don't I don't support affordable housing because it's not affordable." And and they're you know they're not they're not some not supporting affordable housing because they don't want poor people in their neighborhood. <clears throat> they're they are not supporting affordable housing because what they understand to be affordable housing is not affordable. It's too way too expensive. So it's it's interesting when you hear someone say that they don't support that term. You have to dig in sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's the overall message is, you know, talk to your neighbors, talk to your elected officials, both in your, your town or your city, but also at the state mm -hmm. level. And, and the more, you know, the more it's clear that people want to solve this, the more political will and money and resources and creativity and policies can, that can happen to help it. Okay. Um, Anything else people should know either about how to do this from your point of view here? either here in Arlington or throughout the region? Well, one thing I would want to say, and this is just for people in Arlington, really, um, <clears throat> but it's for anyone else. If you have a community development corporation like ours in your community, you should seek them out, is that mm -hmm. we develop affordable housing. It's a huge part of what we do, but we are also about building a community of people who just want to make Arlington better. And how do they find you? And this we is, they go to our website, housingcorparlington.org. There's so many ways to get involved in us, to be on a committee, to participate in one of our events, to volunteer, to just be on the, the newsletter list. And once a month, we'll send you notices about all the different things we're doing. We have a, an annual walk for affordable housing. Organizations like ours are place-based. And while housing is like the core thing we focus on, we're really about building a community of people who are invested to, to make their, their community a better place. Um, and we invite anyone who wants to to get involved with us. Well, thanks a lot, Erica Schwartz, the executive director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington. Uh, thank you for 
viewing and listening. My name again is Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm your host for We Hold These Truths.